here notices and how the moon grew out of Medicare's what's called a beneficiary notices initiative. It's one step in a process of giving people information that they need to make informed choices and really to give them a heads up when problems are arising. So our topics today are going to be uh, around these bullet points. I'm gonna start by offering some context for these notices. And one of the things that's important, I think for everybody to know, is that these notices grow out of your constitutional rights to due process under the law. And I'll talk a little bit about some court cases that contributed to the development of Medicare notices by way of context. Um, we'll talk about provider and patient liability. Um, who's liable for what if a notice isn't given properly? Um, I'll talk about all of this in light of this beneficiary notices initiative and how um, CMS has oh, evolved over time um, when uh, the courts and Medicare beneficiaries have raised concerns about some of the notices. And we're gonna take a look at three um, Medicare notices in particular, one that I think is probably very familiar to you, and that's the Medicare summary notice, the MSN. We're gonna look also in detail at something called the advanced beneficiary notice and then the moon. And I want to say at the onset here that this presentation really grew out of um, uh, Ariel's experience with um, a moon notice and our conversations after he got that notice, trying to sort out, well, you know, what's the provider's liability or responsibility here if they didn't give a good notice? And a lot of his questions grew out of our experience with ABNs, advanced beneficiary notices, where there are many rights and um, procedures clearly outlined that aren't necessarily there for the moon. So Ariel's gonna be talking about his experience with the moon sort of at, well, near the end of the presentation. Um, and so we're gonna go th through this somewhat chronologically um, in terms of the development of these notices. And behind all of this, I want, you to be asking, you know, what is fair and adequate notice? Um, the ideas about what is adequate have changed over time. And um, it's important for you to be aware that it's not always clear about what is an adequate notice. CMS gives some guidance, we'll talk about that, um, but uh, you're on the front lines and you are the ones talking to people who are getting notice in writing or from a provider or whatever it might be. And you're in a position to assess whether or not really that notice was adequate. And there are some things that you can do as SMPs. And for those of you who are in um, a prize, the SHIP program, um, there are things to know about where the notices may or may not be uh, adequate and what we can do about it. So that's where we get into the SMP role and response. Um, so I'm going to start here by talking a little bit about fair notice. Um, there's a court case that, well, actually there was a series of court cases in the early 1980s around um, whether or not Medicare, HICFA at the time, it was called the Healthcare Financing Administration, was giving enough information to people when it was making coverage decisions. And the Gray Panthers, that organization for, of older people at the time, took um, HICFA to court, um, alleging that those notices really didn't hit the mark, um, that people weren't being given enough information about why um, Medicare paid what it did or why it didn't cover something whenever it made a coverage denial. And the litigation went on for several years, um, starting in the late 1970s, and it went through the early 1980s. Um, and this Gray Panthers versus Schweiker, and Schweiker was the name of the uh, HICFA secretary, the HHS secretary at the time under um, uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, the court said that adequate notice lies at the heart of due process. That's one of the key lines from that decision. And I just wanna remind everybody that under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, 
people have a right when the government is making a decision about anything that affects their life, liberty, or property to receive due notice, to get some kind of information that alerts them to the fact that the government is doing something in connection with some of their property or, or life or liberty. In this case, we're in Medicare, it's important for all of you to know that the courts have said, the Supreme Court has said, that Medicare benefits are what's called a property interest. So when the government's making any kind of a, a decision affecting those Medicare benefits, it's affecting a property interest that you, that for you and every other Medicare beneficiary is protected um, uh, under the Fifth Amendment as um, that they need to give you due process when they're making a decision to deny coverage or to in, in effect take away a benefit that you might um, believe you have as a Medicare beneficiary. So anywho, the, um, the courts have said that due process requires notice in writing to a person affected or to that person's representative. Um, they, that due process requires the notice to be comprehensible, understandable, written in clear terms. Um, it can't be written in uh, highfalutin language that uh, you know most folks can't understand. Um, it can't be legalese, in other words. Um, it has to be something more, um, more understandable. And it has to be informative. It has to tell you why Medicare made the decision the way it did. Um, it has to give you specific reasons for denying the benefits. It can't just be something general and vague. And it has to tell you about your appeal rights and procedures. So with that, um, let's see what came out of those court decisions. We're going to take a look first at what's called the Explanation of Medicare Benefits Form. This is a predecessor to the Medicare Summary Notice. For those of you who might have helped your parents, you know, back in the 1980s, you might have seen some of this thing, or your, your grandparents, whomever. This one is from um, my mom, um, who was a Medicare beneficiary at the time, in 1987. Um, I was just starting out as a Medicare educator at the time. So I kept a lot of this stuff just because I thought, well, it might come in handy sometime. Um, well, here we have a handy time. This is an explanation of Medicare benefits form. And as you can see, it's, uh, you know, kind of terse. There's not a, there's not a whole lot of um, real explanation here. Um, the procedure, you know, I follow my cursor here, it's an office service and the date of service is here, what the doctor billed is here, and what Medicare approved is here, all in one line. Um, the approved amount is limited by item 5C on back. We'll take a look at the back side of this and the doctor's name and that he agreed to charge no more for the approved services than the amount approved by Medicare. That's what's called taking assignment. So he's gonna be limited um, in full payment to this 3260. So here you have Medicare telling the, my mom that the approved amount was 3260, that Medicare's 80% payment was 2608 and what she's responsible for. It tells her down here that she's met the deductible. The backside explains that um, over here, how Medicare comes up with the approved amount. This was all issued before Medicare came up with what's called, um, it's, uh, well, I should say it here, that this explains how Medicare came up with its approved amount based on usual customary and prevailing charges. Now Medicare has what's called a fee schedule, so it doesn't go into explaining all of this anymore. But here it shows, you know, what is assignment down here? the bottom, um, what to do if you have questions. Here's a little bit about your um, the time limits for filing an appeal. So basically this was the whole deal in 1987. And this was considered adequate notice based on the court cases that had pre preceded it. Um, you know, obviously it's still a little bit hard to read. Um, it doesn't give you a whole lot of explanation. It doesn't 
uh, do a great job of explaining what how um, um, denials are made and all of that sort of thing. So at any rate, other court cases came about in the night in the, in the early 2000s, and what came out of that was this, um, the Medicare summary notice, which I, I know most of you have seen. Um, and it does a much better job of explaining um, and setting out things like, have you met your deductible? Um, it tells you right here whether or not Medicare approved all of the services. And this is a sample that CMS makes available on its website. So it has some flaws and I'm, I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details of you know, how they calculated things here, but really I wanna highlight, the main thing I wanna do here is highlight how they explain um, some coverage denials. So it alerts the person here to whether or not Medicare approved all of the services and it tells you how many they didn't approve. Well, it's a long form um, in that it will compile things for an entire quarter. And um, let's see here, the next page gives some information about, you know, Medicare updates, a little thing here on fraud, preventive services, more messages, get your flu shot and so forth. That's how they use page two. And then, you know, I, I'm sorry, I should be doing this so you can read this thing better. Sorry about that. That should help. Um, let me just um, go back here a little bit. So here's where it shows how um, services weren't approved. Um, second page, messages. Third page, it gets into your claims. Um, this one shows that Medicare approved a certain amount um, and it paid 80% and then the, the maximum the patient might be billed. So all of these things done um, item by item. Now here's where I want to take a little bit of time. There are two claims here um, from Nazareth Cardiology in Philadelphia um, where Medicare denied payment. Um, it shows you here on a routine electrocardiogram that Medicare's approved amount was zero. You may be billed $55. It gives little codes here, D and E, that refer you to the bottom. D says this service was denied. The information provided does not support the need for this service or item. E says a local coverage determination helps Medicare decide what is covered. An LCD was used for your claim. You can compare your case to the LCD and send information to your doctor if you think it could change our decision. Call 1-800-MEDICARE for a copy of that local coverage determination. We're gonna be taking a good hard look at um, a case involving a local coverage determination a little bit later on um, that will help illustrate what's at stake here for beneficiaries. But these are important things to note. When, you are look, when you're reading MSNs, so important to be checking these notes. And when you see that Medicare has not approved something, be thinking immediately, what's their reason? Is it explained properly? And what has the provider done one way or the other to alert the beneficiary to the possibility that Medicare might not approve this pay, approve payment for this claim. Okay, so just keep those things in mind. We're gonna come back to that in a little bit. Rebecca, right now, um, well, we'll finish up here looking at the MSN. It gives some information about where to, uh, where and how to appeal. And then the contractor's name, know, for, know this, this is going to a company called a Medicare administrative contractor that works for Medicare and CMS, I mean, it's a contractor for CMS that handles original Medicare claims. This is all for original Medicare. And we're focusing today here on original Medicare and Medicare Part B um, notices. So Rebecca, let's um, just check to see if anybody has any questions about the MSNs at the stage of the game. Yeah, um, Norma, I think had uh, a comment 
uh, from a, a slide that you had. Norma, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, many of you know I work with the homeless and we have found that today, particularly because of COVID, many middle-class families or elderly seniors who had Medicare and now find themselves homeless are finding they have no place to turn. Their, con their constitutional rights have been um, ignored with that Fifth Amendment. And uh, when they try to get help, they're pointed to Social Security where they have to start from scratch to try to get um, benefits of some kind before they can, you know, whether they need um, support or any of the other things. Uh, we know that there's a group underway in Pennsylvania trying to create a homeless union where um, the union would fight for homeless people to include getting health care and fighting for their constitutional rights. Pennsylvania right now has ignored that. There are 12 states in the country who have done it, and we're working with politicians trying to get them to uh, pass this kind of legislation. But be aware, when you wind up homeless and you exhaust all your financial assets you are literally left with nothing. And um, I, 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 I hear, you know, we know about these forms and everything, but I find it very frustrating dealing with people who say to me, I used to have Medicare or I had supplementary insurance, but now because I'm homeless or I was evicted, I can't get anything. So I just thought uh, I wanted you people to be aware that this is what's going on. And primarily, there's an influx now because of COVID. Right. And Carl, I see, Carl, I see your hand up. But um, Ren Chenoweth, who is um, on our, uh, who, who was with our carry line, um, had a couple comments. So Ren. Oh, hi, hi, I'm, I'm Ren Chenoweth over at Carrie's um, uh, Carrie Line. I also work in the Apprise office. So that sounds like a perfect example of why you would want to send someone to Apprise. Um, Carrie's Apprise handles everyone who is physically in a portion of North, South, Southwest, West Philadelphia. Um, there's another prize office, Einstein, and they primarily try to handle folks who are primarily hanging out in the further northwest and further northeast sections, but it's not hard and fast. We'll still help folks. Um, so if there's a way for um, your consumers, I understand they're homeless, if there's a way for them to call in to our uh carry line uh and they'll you know we're working remotely so yes unfortunately they'll have to leave a message with a, a good phone number but one of the uh, prize advocates or, or volunteers who are, i see a bunch a bunch of them are on the call right now will be able to reach out to these consumers and go over their options. There are specific rules about Medicare, when you can and cannot enroll. There are, if their financial situation has now dramatically changed, they might in fact qualify for a plethora of different financial programs that they may not have explored in the past. So we can help them connect to that. And then if you are in fact connected to some of these special programs that often gives you an extra enrollment period. So um, there are potential options. And so we like to meet people where they are, hear about what their current situation is, not only their, their medical needs, but then their health care, um, rather their financial uh, abilities. And then we will try to help fit them into either a Medicare plan and or a Medicaid plan. Because remember, if they're now newly homeless because of a serious change in their financial situation, they might in fact qualify for Medicaid and other state programs. So that's a perfect example to send them over to us. And then at the apprise level, when we're working with someone, if we start really sussing out that there's you know, fraudulent 
muck going on, we will then uh, refer that case directly over to our folks in SMP and they'll put on their special hats and figure out what's going on on that level. Great, thank you for the information. We will use it. Wonderful, good. Okay, thank you very much, Ren. Um, I would also direct everybody's attention. There is an interesting chat conversation going on. So when you have a minute, take a look at that. Um, but I'll finish with uh, Carl, you had a question. Yes, I would like to address the, uh, the topic on the rejection that the consumers are receiving. And one of the things is that when individuals make decisions on different claims, I would like to know how much bias that they play into it because the decisions that they are making, we know that they are making of their experience. And from what the understanding that I'm seeing now, a lot of consumers applications are being rejected. And I think I would just like to know how can we find out not only the reason why they was ejected, but also that the individuals that is putting this claim in, what type of information that he put in concerning his way of he's looking at the application. I'm wondering, Ren, do you want to talk a little bit more about helping people with applications for benefits? Yes. Um, in, you know, particularly in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, I mean, just what you're seeing with um, difficulties people might be having. I mean, I can talk about Medicare claims and things that people can do with their providers to make sure that the information gets in, but I think it's a broader question. But the thing is that before they get to them, I would like to know how they made the decision to reject and the reason why they rejected, ensuring that they rejected. Because for example, if you send in a hundred claims out of 125 of them being rejected, we have to know that is the individuals not fully like the claim correct? Is they're not giving the right information of what? Because this is important because if the application is not correctly, they cannot get the service that they need. Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, uh, application assistance and paperwork assistance and, and requesting documents and things, that is something that we can help people in a prize. So we do try to work from that empowerment approach, right? Meeting people where they are and informing them this is the steps and this is the process. And now if someone communicates and or demonstrates they are able and willing to kind of take the, take the information and hit the ground running, great, we'll let them do it. But now if there's someone who's just trepidatious, um, a bit confused, um, you know, it's just a little overwhelming for them. You know, they have other medical issues going on and they just cannot deal. That's fine. We will meet that person where they are and then we will help initiate that. So if that means we fill out the majority of the application and then we're able to send it off via old fashioned mail to a location where they are so they can sign it because many of these documents need to be signed. Um, and then we will, we, we have a wonderful um, office manager who sends out the, everything in a packet. So they have an envelope to mail it back in. Um, then that way they can just sign, fill it out and off it goes. Um, if it's about talking, conference calling with the plan provider, exploring what's going on. Um, oh, technical assistance sometimes. Sometimes we call over with the consumer to the doctor's office. Can you please fill out that form correctly and mail it off so they can get their benefits? You're like One professional kind of talking to the nurse practitioner at the office sometimes helps nudge things along a better way than if it's just a consumer calling saying, oh, I don't know what I'm asking for, but just fill it out. You know, so we will help with all of those sort of things. So our goal is to help people get everything they need and are entitled to. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you, Ren. All right, let's get back to Mike because we've got uh, lots more Okay. Um, and to Mr. Bailey's question there, when it comes to Medicare and the decisions that Medicare makes to deny claims, Ren's point about contacting physicians and 
before that, learning what Medicare requires, what they need to cover a particular service or item. Ren and other folks in a prize are trained, you know, to um, do some of the research there on what Medicare requires. There's a lot of, there are a lot of Medicare rules, you know, for instance, for uh, lab tests um, that if you meet the rules, it's covered. If you don't, it's not covered. And people like Ren who work in a prize and others around the country um, have the resources and are really trained to do some of that research to find out what's needed and then contact that doctor's office to say, hey, we need this. Um, did, the, did the patient meet these rules? Did the patient meet these, they call them coverage criteria. Um, in order to qualify for Medicare payment. And then you make your arguments through the appeals process. We'll have some more on that later, but you know, what people are seeing and, and Norma um, you know, pointed out too, one of the problems with homeless folks you know, that <laughs> we're running into now is that they're not getting these notices. They don't have a place, you know, they're, it's not going, it maybe still going to a home or to an address where they're no longer living. So these things don't, necessarily catch up with them very easily without help from other people who are troubleshooting. Um, and these are very precarious times for folks when it comes to things like receiving notice. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem, you know, that people um, may run out of their um, appeal rights because they didn't get a notice on time. Um, all of that enters into this stuff. So um, all great questions. And Rebecca, I just want to check, is there anything in the chat that you saw that I need to respond to at this point? I, I have not looked at the chat. Um, I don't think so. There's a good conversation with some links, um, but I, I think, and I will hold on, I will uh, capture this chat so that if there are any questions that we haven't addressed, I'll send you, uh, I'll send you those questions and then make sure that any answers I get back from you go out to the group. Sounds good. Okay. All right, um, let me now share something about um, those messages that Medicare gives people on these MSNs and we're gonna take it from there. Let's see, here's some samples of coverage denial messages. An ambulance denial, payment for transportation is allowed only to the closest facility that can provide the necessary care. If you go too far to a facility that's outside, way outside of a service area, Medicare may deny the claim. Here's one for medical necessity. That Medicare summary notice could say in the event of a denial that, or they decided you just, it wasn't reasonable and necessary in your case. The information provided does not support the need for this many services or items. And then this last one is for what are called exclusions, things that Medicare doesn't cover. Medicare does not pay for this item or service. So you might see that at the bottom of an MSN. There are 622 of these messages, standard messages that the Medicare administrative contractors may or may not use in a given case to explain a denial or why they've done one thing or another. They also have some, some anti-fraud messages among those 622, but that's the kind of, um, this is the kind of detail that people get when something's not covered. And we'll take a look at some other messages along the way. Now, one thing that's important to know, and I'm gonna take a step back from Medicare summary notices for a bit, although you may see some information on MSNs about this issue, it's called the limitation on liability rule. Um, LOL is how Medicare abbreviates it. You know, you can't be laughing out loud at this one. Um, it's also called waiver of liability. And this is behind the advanced beneficiary notice. And one of the reasons why Ariel and I had the discussion um, involving the moon a little bit that we'll get into a little bit later on. So the rule is kind of this, if a beneficiary did not know and should not have known that Medicare would not cover the service and the healthcare provider or supplier knew or should have known that it would not cover the service, then 
The liability rests with the healthcare provider or the supplier if it's durable medical equipment, and the beneficiary may not be charged for any costs related to the denied item and or service. So, you know, in a lot of cases, Medicare beneficiaries <laughs> without somebody telling them wouldn't know that Medicare is going to deny um, a particular service from a doctor or a medical equipment item in their in their case for one reason or another, you know, that they didn't meet some coverage rule that they didn't know about. Well, how do beneficiaries then get this knowledge <laughs> about what Medicare covers and what it doesn't cover in their case? Enter the Advanced Beneficiary Notice of Non-Coverage. This is a notice that Medicare devised uh, about 15, 16 years ago when it began what is now known as the Medicare um, Beneficiary Notices Initiative. And one of the problems that this notice responded to was the fact that a lot of Medicare beneficiaries were saying, well, I never knew you know, that Medicare wasn't gonna cover this. And they were calling Medicare and complaining and complaining to their doctors and so forth. So Medicare responded with this standard notice that doctors are supposed to issue if there's some doctors and labs and other providers, durable equipment providers among them, that they're supposed to issue if there's some uncertainty about whether or not Medicare is gonna pay for a given service in a certain case. So it starts out by saying that if Medicare doesn't pay for something like a lab test, you may have to pay. Medicare does not pay for everything, even though um, your healthcare provider might think that you need this. So here, oh, I keep bringing that pull down box here in the space under D, they're supposed to give you the name of the service. Here under E, the reason that Medicare may not pay and the estimated cost. This is all about May, beneficiary making an informed choice about a given service in a given case. So they have options down here under G. One, I want the service. The doc's office issuing this notice says you may be asked to pay now, but it gives the beneficiary the option of wanting Medicare billed, a claim sent in for an official decision on payment. This is usually a good thing to do. Um, so even though they're responsible if Medicare is denying it, they hit, by selecting option one, they preserve their appeal rights. Option two, they pay, no bill goes in, no appeal rights. Option three, they're saying, I don't want this at all. I'm just gonna go home and the heck with it. Um, Here, importantly, this gives our opinion, that is the doctor or labs or medical equipment provider's opinion. It's not an official decision. That only comes when Medicare has issued a Medicare summary notice. So these two notices kind of work hand in glove. These come from providers. It's a standard form that many providers are using now, including some home health agencies and so forth for some things. So we're gonna talk now about some of the rules involving advanced beneficiary notices. Hey, Mike, Mike before you go on there, can I yep. ask a question, please? Sure thing. Okay, so there was, back on the other slide, there was a question about being ambulance services. And ambulance services under Medicare changed dramatically about three years ago. So if they decide to take you where they believe is the first place for medical necessary treatment, and you arrive at your doctor's office and and it's so-called that you use heart attack, but it's not a clear-cut heart attack, and, and they want to take you to the closest place, so they take you to your doctor's office. Medicare will pay for that transport from my house to my doctor's office. The doctor takes a look at me and says, look, you have a history of heart. I want you to go to the ER. The second one falls under this, this notice that you're talking about right now because the provider is not going to get paid for the second transport for the same reason. If it's a different reason, they will get paid, but for the same reason, and it's code heart attack or possible heart attack or whatever code they're going to use there. So my question to you is the fact that no consumer 
Now, I know it because it personally happened to me, but I know it. And also because of being a prize person, I can tell you that you get caught with your pants down on that second transportation, which easy can be a thousand dollars. And no matter what option you want to check on this form, um, the provider, the provider is looking and saying, well, I followed the Medicare rules. I took him from his house to the necessary closest place, but they said, no, get him to the ER and they will not, they will not pay for that. I, I had a fight till my hair turned gray and that happened way back a thousand <laughs> years ago. Uh, guess what, Mike? Um, no, no, no part of this form here that I'm reading here was going to help for a transportation in an ambulance in those cases. And I'm looking to figure out how would, how would a provider figure out that the same person got transported to point A, which was the correct choice at the time, only to be told, no, he needs to go to the ER. Well, John, you're right on target. Um, there, there is no good way for all of that to happen through a notice like this. Um, and Medicare, in fact, says to ambulance companies that if there's an emergency, there's no need uh, you really can't give a, a notice like this to somebody because in an emergency situation, you know, like somebody having a heart attack, somebody really can't make an informed decision. You can't make an informed decision about whether or not to go to the hospital after your doctor tells you to or not. You usually go with the doctors, you know, saying, hey, you've got a bit, you've got a history, um, go. And the ambulance, um, is uh, not required even at, in that situation to give you a notice like this. And like you said, sometimes people are blindsided by this. And the whole thing about notices around ambulance cases is really one of the thorniest and messiest things that Medicare is dealing, I mean, th that you as an apprised person are gonna be dealing with in Medicare um, because the rules don't really, um, address notice very well. And they're also very, um, I think, difficult for you and your doctor to um, overcome on, uh, on appeal. Um, because Medicare says, you know, you didn't go to the right hospital. It's called a technical denial. There's no reason for an ambulance company to give you one of these notices for technical denial. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that later on too. But John, you, you know, you ran into um, one of the, I think most, one of the nastiest conundrums in uh, the whole idea about due process for Medicare beneficiaries when they're in the midst of these kinds of uh, coverage decisions. Yeah. Mike, I'd like to share, Mike, I'd like to share that. knew immediately that they were not getting paid. They knew it. Then, so, right. so now it was a matter of drive off and you have somebody else take you to the emergency room uh, uh, because we know we're not getting paid. Now, for me, I knew how to argue it, but for, and, and I've helped people with this also who ran into the same thing. They don't know how to argue it because their doctor is saying, I want you to go to the ER because you possibly could be having, you know, a heart attack. Uh, you need to go, but it's going to cost you. Fifteen hundred, two thousand uh, dollars. Well, my wife will take me. Okay. Listen, I think Rebecca, we need to. We need to. Yeah, we need to keep moving on. I want to give Ren one more minute because she does. We do have programs at Carry that have been successful. Um, Ren, can you just mention your experience uh, with this? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, John. That happened to you, but um, I have been successful in the past for consumers in helping them um, file appeals. And when um, ambulance bills were not covered um, under emergency situations, we will help collect the doctor's notes uh, that would indicate the medical necessity. So uh, uh, the I, um, unique part is that at Cary, we not only have the apprise, but I'm also the transportation advocate. So that kind of comes together so neatly. So uh, folks, if you do have one of these, like someone saying ambulance bill is not being paid, please send them to carry and we will do our darndest to help. Okay, thank you, Ren. Okay. Um, I'll move on. Let's keep moving on. And we'll do. Okay. All right. So the ABN gives beneficiary evidence of knowledge and then 
it means. You can read some of this stuff later on. Um, I'm gonna focus on this last bullet. It enables providers and suppliers to shift financial eligibility or financial liability to beneficiaries if Medicare denies payment. That's the practical effect of issuing an advanced beneficiary notice. Um, you know, ostensibly it's used to enable people to make informed choices about whether or not they're gonna get a service or not. But, you know, the practical effect of it is this third bullet that it shifts financial liability from the provider in the event that Medicare doesn't cover it. So when are they required? Um, it's mandatory when a denial is likely because a service or item is not reasonable and necessary. That's the main one that people see. Um, the uh, um, Affordable Care Act added these last two. Um, I've not seen them come up all that often, but this is the main one when a provider thinks that it might not be reasonable and necessary in a person's individual case. When are they voluntary? Well, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but doctors, labs, and so forth um, don't have to issue them in certain cases. And that's where what's called statutorily excluded care, never covered. Um, what are called categorical denials, just by the law, it's not covered. Cosmetic surgery is one of them. Dental care and dentures in most cases, these are exclusions from Medicare. And Medicare says to the providers, you don't need to issue an advanced beneficiary notice when one of these exclusions are likely to be the reason for the denial. And there's an assumption that Medicare beneficiaries know this stuff to begin with that it's there in your Medicare and you handbook, things that are Medicare covered and not Medicare covered. So there's that assumption underlying this voluntary issue. It's more as a courtesy here if the provider issues it for under these circumstances. And then there's something called technical denials. This is where Medicare says, well, um, in a given case like John's, um, the ambulance didn't, um, um, the, the, uh, the situation didn't involve a technical aspect of Medicare's coverage rules that's required to meet Medicare's legal requirements for coverage. It's called a technical denial. It's one of the more, to me, um, arcane aspects of Medicare coverage rules. And it's also in effect, one of the most unfair. Um, ambulances, ambulance services are denied because transportation by other means is not contraindicated. That means that Medicare says it can look at a case afterwards and say, well, you know, you could have gone by another means of transport, your wife's driving you, a taxi cab, the bus, SEPTA, whatever it might be, um, because it wouldn't have harmed you to do that. Um, you only get to go in an ambulance when harm would come if you were transported by another means. Well, Medicare says, well, in these cases, they don't need to issue an ABN. So like you were saying, John, people are blindsided and then the only thing you can do is appeal the denial later on. Um, all right, some other things to know. Well, here's a case, a little case study. And I'm gonna ask a question and it comes out of a case that we worked on. Based on what you've heard already, would an advanced beneficiary notice be mandatory or voluntary in this case? There's something called a virtual colonoscopy or also a CT colonography. It's not invasive. It's using CT technology to take a look at a person's colon to see whether or not the person might have some cancerous lesions or something developing there. Medicare says that it's covered as a diagnostic procedure under certain conditions. That means that if somebody, if the doctor thinks that the person may have colon cancer, they can use this procedure to check out to see whether or not there's, there's cancer in the colon. Um, but it's covered as a diagnostic procedure only when you can't use a regular colonoscopy with the scope and everything going through the person's intestines. That would occur when there's an obstruction, scarring, aberrant anatomy, which means things like twisted 
um, colon and things like that, or diverticulitis. Okay. Then there's a local coverage determination for virtual colonoscopy that says co CT colonography is not covered when used for screening or in the absence of signs or symptoms of disease, regardless of family history or other risk factors for the development of colonic disease. So virtual colonoscopy, does the doctor have to give an ABN? What about for the diagnostic? What about for screening? Here's the answer. This came out of a case in Arizona um, brought to us by a ship volunteer, a prize volunteer um, in Pennsylvania there. The beneficiary, a woman, um, received a screening colonography and the doctor did not issue an advanced beneficiary notice because Medicare says it's never covered saying that it's statutorily excluded from Medicare. No ABN if it's screening, she's blindsided too. But up above, if there's a question about whether or not this person's obstruction is bad enough to require virtual colonoscopy as a diagnostic procedure, then the doc would have to issue an advanced beneficiary notice. So essentially the same procedure, two different codes being used, doctors are confused about this. This one came from a Mayo Clinic doc. The Mayo Clinic's, doc, the Mayo Clinic's pr protocols for screening procedures were to say in the event that a regular colonoscopy couldn't work and it had been tried on the woman before and it caused her great pain, then CT colonography is the way to go. So Medicare and Mayo Clinic's ideas about what's reasonable and necessary diverged. Here's some rules about val valid ABNs and folks keep these in mind in the event that you're helping somebody assess whether or not they should have um, received an ABN or whether their ABN is really up to snuff. The form should be the one you saw. A copy is given to the beneficiary, very important. Ask about copies, whether they got one. It's supposed to be given far enough in advance to allow them enough time to make an informed decision specific about the reason it's not going to be covered. And it should be explained if somebody wants quest or has questions about it, the doc's office is under an obligation to explain in its entire, you know, in its entirety, um, uh, <laughs> or uh, answer um, entirely the beneficiary's questions. And here's what Medicare says about what the provider should do in terms of explaining a denial. The notice must give the beneficiary a reasonable idea of why the notifier is predicting the likelihood of Medicare denial. Importantly, statements at a level of detail similar to the approved medical necessity messages for Medicare summary notices are acceptable for written notice purposes. Well, think back on some of the notices we looked at earlier, the sample messages. Medicare doesn't pay for this service or item. How much of an explanation is that? Well, you need to dig a little bit deeper if that's what you see on one of these things. Simply stating that medically unnecessary or that equivalent is not an acceptable reason. Keep those principles in mind. ABNs aren't acceptable if they're unreadable, unintelligible, and meet these a criteria for due process. Um, they can't be given, if it's given to somebody who can't understand it, well, the provider is then gonna be obliged to um, uh, <laughs> assume liability if they did give it to somebody who's really out of it. Um, so keep these things in mind as you help people assess this stuff. They can't give routine notices and Medicare defines them this way, generic notices. Notices that do no more than state that the denial is a possibility. Blanket notices, if you're finding that they give them for everything, that's not allowed. And then if they're asking for people to sign notices before they fill them in, also not allowed. These are all examples of Medicare abuse 
that if it's wide, you know, if it's a big pattern, looks like fraud. So this is where SMP comes into this stuff. Medicare has these rules because this has happened to people. All right, I will end on the ABN thing here with penalties and protections. A healthcare provider who fails to comply with those instructions and the guidance that I've shared with you risks financial liability and or other sanctions like um, civil monetary penalties if there are really bad um, patterns of this stuff. And I should say the only way that the Medicare administrative contractors figure out that there are patterns is when they are sus suspicious about a particular provider when they've done their own research and found things out, or when people submit appeals. That's when they're finding out that a provider's ABN might not have been filled out properly. Otherwise, they don't require providers to submit ABNs. All they ask providers to do is to put a code on the claim form saying that they did issue an ABN, not the actual form itself. So Medicare is only looking at those forms when they suspect a problem or when a beneficiary complains about it. So also keep that in mind, a prize and SMP both. Last point, the MAC will not hold the beneficiary liable if the notifier is given improper or incomplete written notice. Here are the notices related to it. On the MSN, if the beneficiary received notice properly, our records show that you were informed in writing before receiving the service that Medicare would not pay. You're liable. That would be at the bottom of the MSN page as a, you know note D or whatever it might be. Here's what Medicare says if they did get adequate notice. You didn't know the service isn't covered, so you don't have to pay. If you paid and do not receive a refund from your provider, you have six months to send a copy of this notice, your provider's bill, and proof that you paid to the address on the last page of this notice. That's the Medicare contract or the appeal address. So importantly, again, SMP and Apprise both, you may run into beneficiaries who've paid and haven't gotten their money back. Well, start with the provider, let them know that there's this message out there on a Medicare summary notice that says the beneficiaries owed that money back. Um, but if that doesn't work, then it goes back to the Medicare contractor, to the, to the MAC for uh, enforcement. And now we come to the moon. With all of that information about ABNs and due process and everything else, um, here's the Medicare outpatient observation notice. It's given by hospitals. In, 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 in basically, uh, uh, critical care hospitals, critical access hospitals in rural areas, but pretty much most hospitals are, re are required to give this in the event that they place a beneficiary, a patient, in outpatient observation status under Medicare Part B instead of admitting them as an inpatient. People may think that they've been admitted as an inpatient because they're in a bed, like looks like an inpatient bed, but the hospital may be having them there under observation status. And then after 24 hours, they're required to get this notice that tells them here, it's under Medicare Part B as an outpatient. And here are some of the consequences. You're not gonna qualify for Medicare coverage of skilled nursing facility because you're not under Part A. You need three days in an inpatient facility or an inpatient as an inpatient in order to qualify for Medicare's skilled nursing facility coverage if you're uh, discharged to a skilled nursing facility. Um, those are the main things about this. And here's um, another little note, your cost for medications, that Part B isn't necessarily gonna pay for your maintenance medications and some instructions. So it puts people on notice that this is not an inpatient stay, that they may be billed for some things that they weren't expecting to pay. It's an advisory notice. And with that, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Ariel just to, to talk a little bit about a case that he ran into. Um, these are some of the requirements. It's supposed to be given um, if somebody's been in observation for 24 hours, 
um, no later than 36 hours after observation starts. And then also it can be given to a beneficiary an appointed representative, authorized representative or family member acting in the person's best interests. Moon and patient liability. Ariel, you can take it away from here. Thanks, Mike. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, um, as Mike mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this presentation grew out of a case that, um, that I had. And so basically what happened here is that an individual beneficiary was in outpatient um, care and was provided with the moon notice. So what happened was that the hospital staff, they read and they signed the moon notice for the beneficiary, but the beneficiary, which they're allowed to do under certain circumstances, and then there's certain procedures that they have to follow if they actually have to sign the moon notice uh, instead of the, uh, the beneficiary themselves. However, the beneficiary had dementia and had hearing loss. And the hospital records showed that the hospital knew about the beneficiary's dementia and their hearing loss. In addition, um, there were many opportunities that the hospital had to administer the form in the presence of the beneficiary's healthcare agent and to contact the healthcare's beneficiary, the, the healthcare agent. Um, the facility staff, staff actually presented the form when the agent was not there. Um, finally, uh, the facility violated numerous other protocols that are written into the advisory um, moon notice. And that's, that's the key here. It's an advisory notice. So for example, the form, as Mike um, showed you on that last slide, is supposed to be administered within 36 hours after being placed in observation status. In this case, it was, it was not administered within 36 hours. And another violation, for example, is that in case that the, in the case that the form has to be signed by the facility, the family has to receive a phone call and hard copies of the notice. They were not. So the family never received a phone call and a hard copy of the notice as required when the healthcare agent is not present. As a result of all this, the family was blindsided with a $2,500 bill from the, uh, the, uh, the SNF that uh, the beneficiary was discharged to after the, um, the outpatient uh, from the hospital. So what we, were, what we did is we tried to advocate with the hospital, um, but it came to no, uh, it was not productive because the hospital knows very well that there is no um, there's no remedies for going after, um, for, for imposing any penalties upon a provider who does not properly uh, administer the, uh, the, the moon. So in this case, the OIG, I, I, you know, when we submitted it to, the, to ACL, uh, the OIG would not take the case because they know also that the moon does not provide for any provider penalties in cases where guidelines are not followed. So what we did here is the, we referred the client to the Beneficiary and Family Centered Care Quality Improvement Organization, so which is Levanta in Pennsylvania. Um, the client is very savvy, the, the, the healthcare agent is very savvy, so I think she's pursuing some other legal um, avenues in this. But you know, this really just highlights the difference between the moon form and the ABN, where the ABN has some very clear remedies um, in place in case it's violated, whereas the moon doesn't. It's an advisory notice. So um, I'll turn it back over to Mike at this point. Thank you, Ariel. And the, just for everybody's benefit, the work that Ariel did in advocating through, with the hospital was um, exemplary. Some of the best stuff I've seen coming out of an SMP program anywhere in the country. Um, he really pushed um, to clarify the, um, the importance or the lack of importance of the moon um, with the OIG and others. And we kind of ran into 
you know, a dead end. Um, the beneficiaries continuing with, I think, state perhaps legal action to the extent that's possible. Um, but it's important to know that sometimes these notices um, are written, as Ariel said, as advisory um, and not with any real teeth behind them. If this notice, if, if it had been an advanced beneficiary notice given to a person with dementia, that provider would have been liable for the bill. If on appeal, if after a request for review, it had been shown that the beneficiary had dementia and it was pretty clear that the provider knew the beneficiary had dementia, it would be inadequate notice. It would be an unacceptable notice to give that notice to somebody who has dementia when it's well known that the person has a representative. With the moon, no provider liability. Medicare sees this not as a, um, as a coverage determination, but just as a courtesy kind of notice given to people um, when they're in this situation. And I can also mention that there are no appeal rights mentioned in the moon. And that's because we're not sure whether or not people who get the moon will be able to appeal their status as an outpatient as an outpatient. Um, right now, there's a court case underway. It's gone to uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals um, in which the question is being raised, um, can someone appeal a decision to designate them as an outpatient when they've been um, originally thought to be admitted as an inpatient? What hospitals sometimes do um, is admit people as inpatients. The doctors are thinking the person's an inpatient. The patient is thinking he or she's an inpatient. And then later on, the hospital reviews all of that and says, ah, no, we think really they should have been an, an outpatient. Well, that question is being litigated right now. Um, our friends at the Center for Medicare Advocacy based in Connecticut, um, who are really the experts at due process appeals and court and, and litigation um, within Medicare. Um, one at the first stage um, in this process, in the appeals process at the district court level, the government appealed it to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and we're waiting for them to work all of that stuff out. So if there are gonna be any appeal rights that come later on the moon, um, we'll let you know. Um, but that would probably be, uh, um, I'm guessing, at least a year from now. Mike, um, there's a question in the chat that I think it's interesting. Um, not that the other ones are not, sorry. Um, a question about what's the incentive for a hospital to call it observation status rather than admitting a patient? I was wondering if you could just discuss that a bit. Yeah. The incentive is that if Medicare takes a look at a claim from a hospital and decides that the patient didn't really need inpatient care, that they instead were, um, uh, that, they, that they were in for a day or two or three, whatever it might be, and sometimes more, but that it was unclear whether they really needed to be there for inpatient level services, then what can happen is that Medicare will deny payment to the hospital for that inpatient stay. And in the last, oh, about 10 years ago, Medicare actually hired a contractor and this was what kind of um, made a lot of hospi hospitals fearful. One of the contractors actually went in and took a look at claims months after they'd been paid and decided, no, nope, this should have been billed as outpatient instead of inpatient. And hospitals had to repay that and in some cases were fined for their um, mistakes. So they're very skittish about submitting inpatient claims when a person needs just a day or two or three in a hospital. Um, they get dinged financially. Um, so that's one of the reasons that they're submitting these as outpatient 
um, and in some cases, even reversing their decisions to admit somebody as an inpatient initially. Yeah, and I think that there's, there is, there's a lot of pressure in hospitals. They get dinged if they readmit people within a certain amount of time. Yes. So by not admitting them and only putting them on outpatient, they actually never admit the person. So that if they are readmitted, it doesn't show up as a readmission, which they do get dinged. They don't want, uh, I can't remember the rules, but they get dinged if, for example, they have too many readmittance within a 30-day 30, 30 period, I believe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And it's those kinds of incentives that are behind a lot of this stuff. Mike, um, I have a question. Um, what is the, the, and once we, once I ask this question, we can go from there, but what is the status of observation under Medicare Advantage plans, given there's no listed observation rate? I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's a really good, that's, that, I mean, that's a question that's not, um, that I've not run into before. Um, Medicare Advantage plans can, um, you know, they, they uh, <sighs> Medicare Advantage plans contract with their network providers, including hospitals. And the terms of their contracts um, with hospitals, I have to admit, I've never seen one in part because they keep them as, you know, proprietary. Uh, they don't necessarily have to, uh, um, disclose all of those agreements um, to uh, the public. CMS, I think, knows a little bit about them, but it's sort of protected. So honestly, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find out a little bit more about that and uh, and get back to you all. Okay, that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'd like to, um, anybody that has further questions, you can chat, and I'll capture them in chat, and we'll, um, you know, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll get clarification later, but Mike, if you want to move on with your presentation. That's it. Ah, that's it. What can ships do? SMPs okay. and ships. All right. You see unacceptable ABNs, appeal. Um, get those Macs to take a look at it because if they're, um, they'll, be, they'll be looking for patterns and things like that. They'll be looking to see whether or not the provider actually gave a good reason, whether they explain the reason for um, an expected denial properly. If you see coverage denials on Medicare summary notices, check out that note section. Um, if you see anything about um, uh, an ABN, well, if you don't see anything about an ABN, ask the client whether or not he or she received an ABN, whether or not they understood what the ABN meant, because all of that could be used in an appeal if need be. If you see a note that says anything about a local coverage determination and more rarely a national coverage determination, know this, that there's a challenge procedure that's separate from usual Medicare appeals that challenges the actual um, re reasonability, whether or not the, the policy, the coverage policy itself is reasonable with this, um, with the colonography case that I mentioned, we challenged the coverage policy saying that Medicare was denying um, screening colonographies without a really good reason, that they hadn't really taken into account the fact that many women have what are called um, tortuous or tor tortuous uh, uh, colon uh, tortuous intestines that really inhibit the use of the scope. Um, and that it's something that happens after pregnancy. And then we argued that with, um, with the client in this case. So at any rate, the important thing is to know you can appeal these things and that um, appeal the, the ABNs um, if people haven't gotten uh, adequate notice. And if you see things like local coverage determinations being used to deny claims, know that behind that is Medicare's own um, struggling with what's reasonable and necessary. I, so, yeah. Uh, another question um, about the ABN notices. Are they, what's the requirement for providing them in other languages? So. Yeah, um, there are requirements for making sure that people comprehend them. Um, they're, they're available in Spanish. I know that much. Um, mm -hmm. The extent to which 
Um, Medicare requires ABNs to be issued otherwise to, to folks who speak other languages as their first language. Um, it, it's, there, there aren't ABN forms in those languages, but CMS does expect providers to you know, help people with translations, you know, that they bring somebody in who can help explain what these things mean. Um, or contact by phone somebody who can explain what they mean. So there's that um, protection there also with ABNs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, John had a question and then Mike Ebner is uh, up after John. Mike, just a simple observation that 24 to 36 hours on the moon. Uh, someone who goes in an emergency room and is given some type of drugs that do not allow them to be 100% coherent. Um, I did not see anywhere, and I've read everywhere I could possibly read, that those that Moon document has to be presented to the patient within a reasonable period of time of understanding. Because I had one done to me at 2 a.m. And... and uh, I had enough uh, morphine and everything that was put into me for all kinds of reasons that would make me more than um, justified to say that I don't understand what you're telling me. But the hospital said it was done within the correct period of time, 24 to 36 hours. But 2 a.m. is not a reasonable time for a patient who has been given, and, and I was given morphine, so I'm wondering if, if the language doesn't have to be changed so that a patient, and, and especially since no representative was there, my wife had gone home, uh, I was by myself, um, and the, the person who actually read the document when it was all done said, sign this, and I said, no, and she said, I don't care. So somewhere along the line, I'm wondering not only the fact that it's very vague in its whole aspect, but it's very vague in that 24 to 36 hours as to what is a reasonable time to be given to any patient. Ariel, would you be uh, inclined to respond to John's um, point on this one? Because I know you've had you, you had some um, some of the same kinds of uh, questions about all of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, John, I mean, your experience just summarizes the severe limitations of this. It's an advisory notice, and it's just. I mean, your experience really mirrors the experience of that consumer in, in, uh, uh, in the case that I presented. Um, and, and then it becomes, it's just, he said, she said, you know, we were there, their agent was there and there's no appeal rights. And then she said, I don't care. Um, the person said, I don't care. And they probably signed it themselves, which they're allowed to do, but then they have to notice they have to notify you. I will get you the, the, there are certain, there's written guidance as far as the, how long, you know, the 36 hours and also providing notice to the uh, healthcare agent about, you know, the fact that they signed it and advising them of them, providing them a, a hard copy of that. There, there are guidances, but if they're not followed, there's no remedy, it's advisory. And I, I just think the, your experience summarizes the limitations. I mean, hopefully this litigation uh, with Azar is going to, uh, to help. I'm, ve I'm very surprised, Ariel, that the entire moon notice has not just been placed in hold until something can be done for it. Yeah. I, and thank John, you. I, yeah, yeah, John, Ariel, I thank you both. Um, this is one of the issues that we are um, from the SMP and SHIP resource centers bringing to ACL's attention is something called a systemic issue. I mean, the, the, the lack of um, guidance, I mean, just basic guidance about who is competent to receive this, you know, what little extra steps a, a, a hospital has to do, go through to, uh, to make sure that somebody is advised properly, you know? I mean, uh, the, right now, CMS doesn't have great, um, great criteria for what constitutes 
adequate advisory. You know, we've got adequate notice, a lot of that, but not adequate advisory. And that's a big, big hole in CMS's um, regulatory scheme right now. And the moon is prime example. Um, uh, Mike uh, Ebner, you had uh, an issue. Yes. Uh, there's a big difference between a build amount and the Medicare approved amount. Do you have to pay whatever they build or should you have pay what the approved amount is if you wind up paying for a procedure that is sometimes paid? It depends, Mike, on how the provider is billing for that service or item. And most physicians in the United States, and I'm going to say here like 99% of them, accept Medicare's approved amount as payment in full. So Medicare will pay its share, usually 80%. And then people would be responsible for the 20% to bring them right. up to the full approved amount. That difference between the approved amount and the billed amount, most providers, most physicians write off. I mean, it's, it's, it's not billed. Um, there are some physicians, a few, and many medical equipment suppliers who do bill for part of that difference between the approved amount and the higher billed amount. You see it more often with medical equipment providers than you do with docs. Um, the first instance or the first situation that I described where they accept approved amounts is what's called accepting assignment. Um, when Medicare started, beneficiaries, patients actually had to assign their rights to payment over to the doc. And it, in the doc, in doing that, agreed to take Medicare's approved amount. The thing that happens in that case is that the doctor is paid directly from Medicare. The big incentive for them is they get paid more quickly. They don't have to, you know, mess around with billing the patient for that Medicare amount. If it's not assigned and the doc is billing for that overage or excess amount, it's called, um, then the payment goes to the beneficiary. They get a check attached to their Medicare summary notice. You guys don't see that very often anymore, but in 1987, when I was working on this stuff with my mom, we had checks in the envelopes all the time. She, care, she collected all of these Medicare summary notices. I was away at school or after, in 87, I was living in uh, another city, but she collected all of her Medicare summary notices and put them all in the, in the bottom of a, a dresser drawer. So when I'd come home, <laughs> she would have tons of Medicare summary notices with checks attached to some and some not. You're likely to see that happen with, medic with medical equipment claims more than, more than not. Now, that, that's where it comes up. And with medical equipment claims, there's no upper limit except for what are called um, the competitive bidding um, items. But for many kinds of medical equipment items, there's no upper limit on what the, um, the supplier can charge. They can charge for that difference between the approved amount and their billed amount. With docs, they're limited to 15% under law um, uh, of what they can charge beyond the approved amount. But with medical equipment suppliers, you know, actually the sky's kind of the limit. And we see that we've seen some complaints about that coming out of other states, not so much in PA. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Rebecca? Yes. Yes, I was just responding to a chat message here. Um, Dan mentions that it's not a solution to the moon issue, but <clears throat> your attending physician sometimes helps. Good. So... Um, if you, uh, Mike, if you want to stop sharing, I'll be able to get everybody on. I'll be able to see everybody and see if there are any other questions. Okay. There we go. Okay.